Jesus Christ is here and anything can happen for anybody at any time because you are in the place where the healer of all healers is at, where the deliverer of all deliverers is. I, I mean, I love you and I'm going to do my best to help you, but honestly, I can't do anything for you other than just share what God wants to do. But thankfully, he's here right now and what you need is available to you. I believe that God is here and I have faith that something powerful will happen in your life today. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. It'll cut and, as and divide asunder the soul from the spirit and the joint from the marrow. And, and it is a discerner of the intents of the heart. And I believe that God's word is going to go forth today and it is going to cut deeply into the human heart where it needs to cut and separate from us the past that needs to be separated off of our lives and connect us with what's new. I just believe God is here and absolutely anything can happen for anybody body at any time. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. What an honor to be here at the house of prayer this morning. We love you so much. We are so grateful for this church. Uh, my wife and I were just completely displaced in this past hurricane and we weren't able to travel because of the things that were going on and just not able to get out and move around. And after a week of that, and you know, you only got a couple of days to go somewhere and you don't have a place to live, you can uh, get angry at God. I mean, you can get a little frustrated. You can get a little scared. And Sunday morning, I had to get out by Tuesday, Sunday morning, five some in the morning, I was just sitting on the concrete outside of my apartment. And I just I had this idea of God just turning and I said, God, why are you stiff arming me? God, where, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? You know, and, and, and I, I got up that morning, got my wife up and I said, you know, let's, let's go to the church. You know, we're not traveling out. So let's go to the house of prayer right here in Thibodeau. We came and connected with you, with our church family that's right here. And as your worship team began to sing and worship and said, not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. I just began to lift my hands and worship. And two hours ago, I was saying, God, why did you forsake me? Why did you abandon me? But when I got with the family of God, I began to say, God, not for a minute was I forsaken. I trust you. Something's going to happen, God. Amen. And by the goodness of God and the goodness of good hearted people, someone opened their home to us and my wife and I are safe. We have a place right now. And just thank the good Lord for that. Thank you for good people. Amen. Who received us. Amen. But I'm so grateful. I'm saying that to say thank you. You gave us a place to, to come and hide when we needed some refuge and didn't have anywhere else to go. And we, we just love you. And, and I'm also grateful that you stayed whenever they brought me up to speak this morning. I mean, you know, I, I thank the pastors. I always do because the pastor invites you, you know. But if I walked up and, and y'all would have just left, that would have been really hard to preach. So uh, thank you all. You know, amen. And speaking of the pastors inviting us, my pastor used to always say it's easy to get invited to go speak, but can you get invited back? So thank you, Pastor Josh, Sister Keisha. We love you so much. Thank you for the honor to speak here in the ministry where God is leading and, and you all. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm just going to read the opening verse. It says, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. I want to talk to you on the subject this morning, the root of the wound. Because we go through life and things happen. Life happens and we get wounded. But sometimes we think it's our dad, our mom, our spouse, our, our girlfriend. We think it's our boss or the teacher. But the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's actually something a little deeper going on under the surface. There's, there's a root to all this. And I want to talk about the cause of it. I want to talk about the root of the womb. Lord Jesus, thank you for letting us be in your presence this morning. I give you honor, Heavenly Father, for what you're about to do in this house. I pray you would speak through me and let us respond in faith to your word. Let life change happen today. Let this time be so valuable that life change would happen forever and ever moving forward from this moment in your presence. God, I thank you for what you're going to do and honor you in the wonderful name of Jesus. And, and I just thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you want to be seated this morning, you can as we talk a little bit for the next little while on the root of 
the wound. I, I find it a little interesting that the Bible is saying that this man is on a journey and he falls among thieves. And these thieves come and they, they beat him up and they take his money, which obviously, you know, if, if I'm going to rob you, I mean, if somebody's going to rob you, then uh, they're going to beat you up. They're going to take your money. You know, but it says something strange, too. It says that they took his clothes off. And, and I'm no scholar, but I was like, why does the Bible say that they, like, took his clothes off? That's a little strange to me. But thankfully, one day, I was sitting in the church, and it had been several years. I was about 15 years old at this time, and several years of going through different things myself in life. And I heard somebody preaching on YouTube, and, and God began to minister to me from this idea of clothing. And, and the preacher was talking about it, and it, it clicked. It made sense. And I realized the significance of what the Bible's saying here when it says that they took his clothes off. You see, in those days, that you had to wear a garment that identified you with your illness. If you had diabetes, for example, you would have to wear something that indicated to everyone around you that you just so happened to have diabetes. It was part of your identity. It was part of your issues. It was part of your past. And, and the law stated that if you were in public without these garments identifying you with whatever situation it was you were dealing with, that you could be stoned. Now, that's the significance of blind Bartimaeus who's crawling out to Jesus and they say, yo, be quiet. And he starts crying out even more. And then Jesus stands still and calls for him. And the Bible says he's, he's standing, casting aside his garments went to Jesus. That's why the Bible says that he took his clothes off because he was saying, he says, you know what? I might be blind and I have this clothing identifying me with my blindness, but I have so much faith that Jesus is here and anything can happen that you're going to heal me of this blindness. And if you don't, I'm going to die. I mean, I'm just laying it all on the line, but he understood that his clothing was tied to his identity. So when the Bible tells us that they got this dude and beat him up and they took his money and they took his clothes off, it is letting us have some insight into the reality that what they were really doing was stripping him of his identity. They wanted for this man to wake up and not know who he was. They wanted people around him not to know who he was. That is why the Bible says that he was left there half dead, because you can recover from no money. You can be broke, but you can get money. Somebody said amen right there. You can be wounded. You can be beat up, but you can go to a doctor. You can get medicine. You can put a bandage on it. You can get healed from that. But, but when you start losing your identity and you start forgetting who you are and you start questioning things about yourself, the Bible says you can end up halfway dead on the middle of the journey of life. And so what happens in life now, we can understand, is that when things come at us and we think it's just a surface issue or we think it's somebody who's just angry at us and we think it's the boss who's just passing us up and we think it's just the teacher who prefers our other classmate above us and makes comments like, oh, you're so stupid and you'll never amount to anything. And, and, and our parents say things about us and don't do things for us and all these things happen. At the root of what's really going on is that there's a battle that is taking place and the battle is over who you are. It is about identity. It's about identity. Can I get real with you for a minute? See, when, when, when I was growing up and, and, and I had my happy home with my dad and my mom, it took me about a, maybe three months of age to start recognizing that it wasn't as happy as I would hope for it to be and that my dad was on crack and that he was an alcoholic and he would beat me and my mom. He would beat her and then as I'd get older, I would start asking my mom. I'd say, Mom, I'm five years old. I'm saying, Mom, why are we still here? Why don't we get out? And I didn't know it, but my dad was threatening my mom into that situation and he had told her, if you ever leave me, I'm going to take Aaron from you and I'm going to bring him into Mexico and you're never going to see him again. And so I'm saying, Mom, why are we sitting here in this situation? Why don't you take me to Grandma's house? Why is Dad still coming home like this? What, what is going on? And Mom's saying, one day, baby, you, you're going to be okay. One day I'm going to get you. You're going to be safe. And I didn't understand. But what, what was really going on and what I didn't understand was that there was something after my 
identity. It wasn't just dad being a drunk and dad being on crack and dad coming home and beating me and dad beating my mom in front. It wasn't just that. It was the fact that there was also a little boy who was growing up in the things of God, who had a grandmother who knew how to pray, who was coming up into the, into the, in Sunday school and who heard the things of God and who was exposed to the things of God. And, 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 and I, I was beginning to also understand that there's something about my life. God wants to do something with me that there's a God, he's real. And, and I began to know some things about myself while all the while there was a battle going on that was trying to get me to forget myself and then finally thankfully at seven years of age my mom was able to blackmail my dad legally into not wanting to go to prison by the evidence my mom pulled on him and so he was willing to sign the papers and leave quietly we got out of that we got into another situation we went from stepdad to stepdad all I really wanted for each one of them to do was love me like he loved his own children but he never really worked that way and and all the while I, I'm not realizing and I'm thinking I just got a stepdad who loves his kids and doesn't love his stepchild I, I didn't really understand that what was happening is that that there was something going on that was after my identity, trying to get a little boy who had the hand of God on his life twisted and warped into thinking he could never be a man that would take care of a family and they would never know how to handle his own because he didn't have a male role model and start twisting things up inside of my head about myself. And that is what has happened in your life since you have been a little bitty baby. It's not just people coming after you and being mean. It's not just this little thing or that little side thing going on. It's that God has ear marked you for greatness. God has set you apart. He knows who you are and he has a plan for your life. But there is an enemy who doesn't want that plan to be realized. But it's okay because Jesus Christ is here right now and anything can happen for anybody in this house. But I'll tell you what has happened is that just like me, you grew up in a home too. And maybe your parents didn't do the things that they were supposed to do. Maybe they did a lot of things that they weren't supposed to do. Maybe you didn't get the same kind of situation, uh, uh, kind of context that you would hope for or that other people you know have had in life. And you've had to grow up with, watch this, an identity crisis. Because at the crux of it all, that's what's really going on. That's why she cheated on you. That's why she left you for another uh, man. That, that's why all these years he's been beating on you and telling you you can't find nobody else. That's why what has happened in your life has been happening. Because all of it is, is an attack against your identity. It's all about twisting your imagination about who you really are. And if that wasn't enough, because it seemed to not be enough, because even though I had been beaten, I kept on clinging to God and clinging to the things of God. But when I was 10 years old and my dad had gotten off of drugs and they kind of squashed some stuff and I would go visit every now and then. It was nice. It was fine. I was glad to see him. But all of a sudden I went visit with my friends. We were spending the night and dad started to do the most inappropriate, perverted, twisted things to me and to my friends. I'm not going into details, obviously, but it lasted for months and it was perverted sexual abuse. I went with that and carried that and then all of a sudden he stopped never talked about it I never told anybody about it for years and years and years I didn't know how to say it I didn't know what how I was going to express it I didn't know what to do and I wrote one of the books that I have published is called from a great mess to greatness I detail the story in there my mom found out when she read the published book that's how she found out was with the rest of the world because I carried the shame and I didn't know how to explain it or expose it but one day I was in church by myself and I heard some preacher on YouTube preaching about clothing being tied to identity and that the battle's about your identity and then something shifted in my spirit and I began to realize that God is not just a healer of a human body I've seen those great miracles I've seen him heal people of cancer I've seen spines made straight and x-rays confirming but I've also realized that God is a healer of the human heart that God is the healer of relationships that God is the healer of the human mind of the soul and he can get down to where I was broken and abused and molested and taken advantage of and he can get down and he can begin to heal a little boy who didn't know who he was and I believe that same Jesus is in this house right now and he knows what they did to you and he knows what they said to you and he knows that he wasn't there for you and he knows that she turned her back on you but God knows where you're at and he brought you here on purpose why because he wants to talk to you about your identity he wants you to remember who you are in him he wants you to be healed and set free from the things that have latched themselves onto you and tried to warp your identity about yourself and that's why he told Jeremiah in chapter 1 verse 5 he said before I formed you in the womb I knew you 
when you were a one cell zygote before you became the trillion cell adult right now, when you were put in your mom's belly, I knew you. And, and, and you have to understand God knew you with a purpose. God knew you with a destiny in mind for you. That is what Ephesians 2 and 10 says. It says we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that we may walk in them. In other words, a baby doesn't show up on the planet and God say, oh, my God, what I'm going to do with this one. You were not a surprise. You were not an accident. You may have been adopted, but you weren't an accident. You may have been forgotten and abandoned, but you're not an accident. I want to tell you something. God looked at a purpose, at a destiny, at, a, at something he wanted done on this earth. And he took the end and began to work backwards toward the beginning. And he said, okay, who do I need to fulfill this plan? Well, she's going to need this personality and these preferences. She's going to need to speak this language, be born at this time. She's going to need to be raised in this family because in the situational context of their family, I'm going to put these things into her. I'm going to take these things out of her. And I'm going to just orchestrate her life. That's what it says. He says, you are God's workmanship. He is handcrafting you to be you. He is making you. He is shaping you. And it says why he did it. He said, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That means God has a work for you to do. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for your life. He has something designated specially for you. And we miss this because we think that works means that, oh, I'm supposed to preach or I'm supposed to sing. And if I can't do either one, well, woe is me. That is not what it's talking about. Works can be any entrepreneurial endeavor that you can use to contribute to the advancement of the kingdom of God, to the well-being of those around you. Guess what? Plumbing is an entrepreneurial endeavor that we need because churches need toilets. So it's not just a spiritual thing, okay? Uh, toilets are spiritual. I wouldn't be here without a toilet. I need me one every couple of hours. You know, I drink coffee on Sunday morning. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I need some help from those of you who have giftings that I don't have. That's what is called being a body of believers. And so God has a work and he knows what that work is. And so he creates you to fit the work. Why does he do that? That you may walk in it that you may actually live out your purpose, that you may actually fulfill that role. It might be because you, you're going to contribute this way or that way. I don't know what it is specifically for you, but what he told Jeremiah was, he says, I, I knew you before I formed you in the womb and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. A prophet unto the nations is a fill in the blank for Jeremiah. Just take that out. But God knew you before he formed you in the womb and he ordained you to be exactly what it is that God had in mind whenever he created you as his workmanship and he handcrafted you to perfectly fit into the design that he has for you. Be that your prayer ministry, be that you reaching out to people in the community, be that knocking on doors of people who've been displaced and, and need a meal right now and just encouraging them. Be that some, maybe, maybe God made you wealthy on purpose so that you can bless people around you. Maybe God is doing something in your life or in your ministry or in your business or in your family so that he can raise you up and do a great work in you and a great work for you. And that is the purpose of God and the design on your life. And he clarified the that with that purpose and created design on your life in John 10 and 10, that there is an enemy against you and he has come to kill, to steal and to destroy. We say that scripture all our lives, but what is he trying to kill? What is he trying to steal and what is he trying to destroy? It's not your salvation. You're already saved. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter, though, if you can be saved or if you can know God, but you cannot necessarily fulfill your true commission on this earth. If you cannot actually operate in that role and in that function, then a piece of the body is going to be missing. So what his role is, is to steal your purpose. It is to kill your design. And how does he do that? He gets down into who you are and he starts trying to twist and pervert what God did in the womb. And he starts trying to make you think things about yourself that are not true, that are ungodly that are unbiblical, that have come from the lying lips of human beings around you that was never intended for God's plan for your life, for your mind, for your body, for your, God didn't intend that for you. And so all uh, this time, what has been happening is that there has been a battle going on for your identity. That is the root of the wound. That is why what happened in your family happened. And guess what? That's why what didn't happen in your family never happened. It's because deep down inside, the enemy wants to kill and destroy and, 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 and take your purpose and make you think something about yourself that God never intended for you to think about yourself. And that will leave you half dead your whole life, alive and breathing and operating and connecting with the material world, but wondering inside, who am I and what's my purpose and why am I here and why don't I feel fulfilled? It's because the Bible said he was left half 
half dead because they stripped him of his identity. But if we go halfway through John 10 and 10, we'll be half dead too. But the Bible doesn't stop there. But after he said he came to kill and steal and destroy, he says, I came that you might have life and that you might have life. Come on, somebody more abundantly. Jesus Christ has abundant life, which is you knowing who you are, which is you not getting twisted, perverted images and ideas in your mind about your identity. And it's you recognizing I am a child of God. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. He has called me and I am who he said I am. The, 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 the teacher might have said you're stupid, but the Bible says he has showered me with all wisdom and understanding. The Bible, you might, you might kind of look at yourself and compare yourself to Instagram and think you're ugly. And maybe he told you he was ugly, but honey, he's a liar because the word of God is truth. And the word of God said there is beauty in holiness. I'm here to tell somebody today, you are who God says you are. You're not who the devil says you are, who your daddy says you were. You ain't who anybody around you says you are, who society says you are, who the magazines say you are. You are a child of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And that is who you are. And God wants you to see in a full panorama exactly who that is. That is the whole journey of spiritual growth and learning about the things of God. Can we take a step deeper? Can we go there together? Can I go with the rest of you who didn't say, yeah. <laughs> see, 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 Jesus comes into Caesarea Philippi one day and he asks this seemingly random question. He says, hey, who do people say that I am? He's talking to his disciples. And he's like, who do they say I am? What, what you heard about me, right? And this is three levels of revelation I'm gonna take you through real fast. And, and, and the disciples say, what they say, you know what, man, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. You know, some say this, some say that. And he says, cool, cool. You see, and it is cool. Jesus said cool, is that in the Bible? It's, it's like implied in, in between the you know, <laughs> lines there, you know? He, what he's saying is, because he didn't say that was wrong or bad, and it's not. What, what that is, though, is that's the first level. See, that's what everybody tells you about God. See, that's what, that's what the Sunday school teacher told you. That's what you learned in catechism. That's what you heard the priest and the preacher preaching about all your life. That's what you heard about God. Nothing wrong with that. I heard about God. It's what my grandmother told me about God. It's me relying on grandmama's prayer life to get through all the things in school, like not getting expelled again. You know what I'm saying? It's me relying. It's, it's what TDJ said on TBN. I mean, come on, somebody. It's, it's what you heard Joel Osteen say on the car, in the car on your way to work. And you know how Christians listen to Joel Osteen, like worldly music. We just put it in, listen, but don't tell nobody we're really listening to him. You know, we do it. I know, I know you heard about him. So that, that's, that's good because that teaches you about God. And congratulations, you know about God that's good but Jesus says he just he did he's like cool but who do you say that I am tell me about your prayer life what what has God showed you in the Bible what what do you know about God okay but do you know God who do you say that I am and Peter speaks up he says thou art the Christ the son of the living God and then Jesus says, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. See, Jesus is saying you're in that second level because you're not just hearing about the fact that God heals people. You've been healed. You're not just hearing about the fact that God will speak to you in prayer. You hear God talking to you and telling you where you need to go and what you need to do. You started to develop a relationship with God for yourself. Now, you know God. And he said, Cool. Cool. But I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I'm glad you know about me, and I'm glad you know me, but now I want you to know yourself. I say unto you, you are this person and upon you 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 single mother I'm gonna raise up one little boy who's gonna be a speaker who's gonna change the United States of America forever he you might have the president you might be a single mom right now struggling but what you're really doing is not just trying to make ends meet for a little boy you might be raising the president of the United States who's gonna change this thing and turn it around for the glory of God you don't know the full extent of where you're at right now but God has ordained you and he said I want you to know who you are I want you to see this about yourself I want you to understand some things about 
you. And then all the while, though, we get like Peter and we say, yeah, but Jesus, I don't know. You might not have been there, homie, but I got angry one day. They was trying to arrest you. And like I took a sword and cut this cat's ear off. Right. And so, you know, I just don't make decisions all that well thought out beforehand. And Jesus says, I know you got problems, Peter. But let me tell you something. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Because, you see, I had that tendency. I say, God, but I'm I'm Aaron J. Dagle. I was the one that was molested. I was the one that was abused. I was the one that didn't know myself. I was the one that was always struggling, trying to prove myself. I was the one who was broken. I was the one who I, I came up from here. God, I, and he says, yeah, but thou art Aaron J. Dagle. And upon this young man, I'm going to send you out to this country and that country and speak in this church. And that church. I want to tell you something. You don't know, might not know all of what has happened in your life up to this point and why. But I can tell you this. It's for a reason. And Jesus wants you to see who you are. And he can look at you right here in this altar this morning and say, yeah, I know you've been through this. I know you've been through that. I know you messed up, but you are so and so. And upon you, I will raise up this ministry. I will raise up this church. I will change the food parish. How? How, God? Because you might not have been there, but I denied you three times. I know you messed up, Peter. So did Aaron. So did Pastor Josh. So did everybody else that you look around and see you God using. But you know what? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Can God get it through to me at one point finally in my life that he wants to do something in my life, that he has a purpose for me, even though I'm broken and messed up, and even though I come from where I come from, and even though the things have happened that have happened to me, can I just finally accept that God loves me, that I'm his child, and that I'm supposed to have an impact for him in this world? When can I finally accept who I am in Christ because when I can accept it that's when I go into the third level of revelation and I began to hear him say thou art Aaron and upon you I'm going to do this can you hear him speaking to you right now and saying you are so and so and upon your life this is what I'm going to do this is what I'm going to do it's hard because all the wounds and all the things that have happened that try to pull you away from that every wound in your life what is its whole purpose is to push you to the lowest level of revelation it possibly can God wants to get you to the third level and if if the wounds can twist you and, and make you forget your identity you just have an experience with God that's okay according to the devil it's better than you know who you are but you know what's even better if he can get you out of having a personal encounter with God and he can get you to just rely on religion and just rely on everybody else's walk with God and he can keep you pushed out and that that's that that's even better you know what's even better is if he can get you so angry and twisted and hurt and into and, and where you just give up on God altogether and he can push you out to where you're no longer even listening to the first level of revelation that is what the root of the wound is is to try to push you down into the lowest level of revelation and God's whole point is to turn it around and bring you through all that and get you to hear about him but then to experience him but then to see who you are so that like the song says you can say when I lock eyes with you I see my reflection I began to get reflected now I can imitate Christ because I can see him for who he is and now I know who I am and I can be like him I wonder if somebody this morning who's been ransacked through life who has been tossed and turned like a rag dog and chased around and beat up and just told, I wonder if you can say you know what I hear God speaking to me saying that he, that, that he wants me to know who I am to day that he wants to restore my identity that God is speaking to me and he wants to change me and take me to that place where I know who I am that's what I want for you today is for you to get a revelation of who you are in God and I promise you that every fight in your life is going to be to keep that and to stand for that and to hold on to that can I tell you one more story can I tell all the rest of you one more story? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. Okay, oh, let's stand. Uh, Jesus, in the very last verse of Matthew chapter 3, he gets baptized. And this is when the, the, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove from heaven. The voice of the Father speaks out and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Wow. That's awesome. The next verse, Matthew 4, 1, Jesus is led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Two verses later, the devil's up in his face after he'd been fasting for 40 days. And he says, if thou be the son of God, make these stones turn into bread. You missed it. God said, this is my beloved son. Three verses later, the devil pops up and he says, if thou be the son. Prove it. 
You see, what happens in this little situation here is there's a battle going on for the identity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ knows who he is, and the devil's trying to tell him otherwise. He's trying to talk him out of who he is. He's trying to get him to prove himself. If you're the son of God, prove it. He did, the next temptation is the same thing. He takes him on the top of the temple, and he says, if thou be the son of God, jump, and the angels are going to catch you. You know what he's saying? He says, if you're really who God told you you were, whenever you think you heard from God, then go ahead and prove it. And that's what happens is all through our lives, we start trying to battle for our identity, but we feel like it gets stripped from us, and so we start trying to prove it, and we start trying to make a name for ourselves and an image for ourselves so that we can prove it. That's how it comes out in all kind of walks of life. Some of us do it through education. Some of us do it through how, what we post on Instagram by letting everybody know how wonderful our world is. Some of us do it in ministry by claiming our territory and fighting and, and, and conniving and making our, our, our position known in churches. And we do it all kind of different ways. And we, we, we show the world how great, but what we're trying to do, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to prove it. We're trying to prove it because we don't really know who we are because somewhere deep down in our crevices of our broken lives, something got twisted up, something got perverted in our self-image, in our self-identity, and God is in this place saying today, you don't have to continue trying to prove it. I'm not here as a speaker trying to hurt you or, or belittle you. I, I, I'm not telling you pride. I'm not telling I'm here because I love you and I want to help you this morning. I know that there's people here trying to prove yourselves because I can see the hurt and I know that there's people whose lives match the identity of the things that I've been through in my life as well. And I know what it was like trying to prove it and trying to show everybody until I finally had to just come to a place in God where I recognize I don't have to prove anything to the devil, to the world, to anyone in society, even to myself. I just have to know who I am in Jesus. I have to know that Aaron is the son of Jesus Christ, that he has been accepted as the adopted child into the fold of God, that those who are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. All I have to do is know who I am. I wonder if there's somebody this morning who's tired of trying to prove yourself to yourself, tired of trying to prove yourself to the world around you. Would you stand with me this morning? If you are tired of trying to make it known to yourself, to anyone around you, to, to, to just try to say, look, look, I'm important. Look, I matter. Then what that is revealing to you about yourself is that somewhere there's been a wound and at the root of the wound, it's been an identity. It's been something that's tried to twist and pervert who you are. And I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ is here to heal you, to show you that you are somebody in him, that your identity is wrapped up in him, that he knew you before he formed you in the womb. Do you know the Bible says the hairs on your head are numbered? That doesn't mean he knows how many hairs are on your head. It means when a hair falls out, God knows that's hair number 87,432 that just fell off your head. That's how much in intricate detailed God knows you and loves you you are a son of God you are a daughter of God God wants you to know today you are secure in him he's got you he's got you they lied to you they hurt you what they said I'm I am so sorry I am it wasn't right it wasn't fair and I do not excuse it I don't excuse I won't excuse my father what he did was horrible and he was wrong for what he did. But deep inside, it wasn't just him. It was my identity. And just like when I heard this message and I squirmed and writhed around on the carpet in that house, in, in, in that church, and I cried out to God and I said, God, you need to heal me. Sometimes you got to come to the altar and you just got to say, God, heal me. God, I can't hold this back anymore. I, I get the image of that bathrobe that they put on you in a hospital. I know it's a little vulnerable. I know it feels a little funny, but sometimes you just got to get vulnerable in the presence of God. If you can't do it in the house of God, honey, where are you going to do it? I want you to know that you're in a safe place and that Jesus Christ is here and anything can happen at any time. It is time for God to do something in your heart, not just for you to come and hear a preacher preach a sermon, not just for you to hear the word, but to receive the word and to be changed for there to be power and demonstration in your life, for something to happen, for something to break off of your past right now, for forgiveness to take place so that you can be detached from what was said, detached from what was done, and that you can be healed and made whole, and that you can look the devil in the face and say, I don't gotta prove anything to you, I know who I am. Would you get real with God today? I, I know this is gonna be vulnerable for you, but if you want God to heal you, I'm going to open the altars. If you want God to change your life, I'm opening the altars right now. As we begin to worship, I just want you to respond and say, God, here I am. 
you spoke this to me you surfaced this up in my life for me it was being molested it was being abused for you it might be that it might be something different but I know it's about your identity would you come and let God do a work in your heart that only God can do